Um, welcome everybody to the 942nd monthly meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. We are one of the largest and oldest organizations involved in amateur uh, telescope making and astronomy in the country. Um, this is our annual business meeting, so we'll be hearing a little bit more from Eileen than we normally do. Our guest speaker tonight is Jeff Chester, and the title of his talk is Sky and Ocean Joined, A Brief History of the United States Naval Observatory. And so I think we're going to have a fun time tonight. Um, I'm pretty tired, so around 10.30 tonight, I'm going to probably wave goodbye and, and leave the meeting, but um, let's press forward and we'll see where this takes us. So, as always, this is the agenda. Um, it hasn't changed, and so I'm not going to bore you with the details. Okay. I can't see my image, but we'll go with this. Uh, just well, my thoughts, my thoughts on astro imaging. This is what uh, that's volume one of the basics of astrophotography that was sent to us by Julie Kaufman. <laughs> we'll go to the next slide. That checks out, Glenn. That checks yeah. out. All right, here's the next slide. And I was saying, old men and comets have been reverenced for the same reason their long beards and pretenses to foretell events. And next. Of course, there's a lot of chatter about today's eclipse and uh, the emails were just all over the place. I was looking at them last night and I thought, boy, you got all these lemmings rushing to the ocean to see if I would see that part of the eclipse. I wasn't about to get up that early and try to drive all the way to the sea coast, but I did get up. Uh, I figured if I got up, I'd go and look for it. And I did. I got up at about maybe a quarter of six. So I drove down to a local parking lot nearby and set up. And one thing, uh, they say never look at the sun which is true, especially if you're driving. I kept looking to see if the, if the clouds were covering the sun or what. When I got to my location there, there were spots all in front of me. I had a hard time setting up. Uh, I can but see I can the headlines, see Glenn, I can see the headlines now. Elderly man killed in freak accident. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, another thing is when I set up my, my Coronado PST, I rely on the, the, the shadow of the sun to, you know, to get, the, to get it online. And of course, my shadow went all the way across the parking lot. So I had a hard time with that. But I finally got set up. And, um, you know, I have to admit, I really wasn't that excited about this. But when you see that sun, you see that cookie bite, it doesn't matter what's going. It just was really an exciting sight. So it was kind of neat. But I was there with myself for company. And I'll tell you how bad it was. At one point, I just looked up and I tried to see where's the moon this time of morning. Just it's usually when I get up in the morning, I look to see if the moon's in the sky. And I said, wait a minute, you bonehead. The moon. You've been looking at the moon for the last half an hour. <laughs> and I also had a little discussion with myself. I saw my reflection in the car window. So I just took a look and said, boy, have you gotten old, you old fart? And then I went back to business. So quite an adventure, but it was it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I, it's just kind of a serious note. There won't be that many uh, more eclipses in my lifetime. So I got to enjoy whatever ones I can. Glenn, anyway, I didn't check. this is when the moon is good. This is the one time oh. of the year the moon is great. Wait, how do I mute Mario? Hold on. Your best friend. <laughs> but yeah, it was a, it was a nice sight, and uh, I enjoyed the whole thing. And like like you guys, I was tired the rest of the day, but it was worth getting up to uh, to see the event. By the way, this particular picture, there were a whole bunch that was sent in, and uh, what I did. No one eclipses me. Well, tell my wife that. She won't believe for a second. Um, the picture here was taken by Al Slisky. And I just went with the first one that was sent. He was he beat everybody the punch. But then I looked at the time. And uh, according to this, he sent this at 4 o'clock in the morning, which the eclipse hadn't happened. So this is actually a picture of a partial eclipse that took place that Al saw 10 years ago. But we snuck it in there anyway. But nice job, Al. And all the pictures you guys took are fantastic. Is, is Al still on or did he, did he leave the meeting he's, now? He's hung up, I think. Um, well, like I said to everybody, um, I sent out an email this afternoon and um, I suggested that, and I said this earlier at the, at the, just before the meeting started. Um, if, you have, if you have Eclipse pictures that you'd like to showcase at the July meeting, that's the perfect month to do it because it's a speaker month. It's a members, um, membership speaker. Uh, the members speak at that meeting. And so... You know, send me a, a note uh, with some images attached and I'll put together the slide presentation for that um, meeting and, you know, bring with you, you know, the why you chose that location, what tech, what equipment we're using, you know, what sort of filtering did you use and, and maybe we can all learn a little bit about eclipse photography from all of you, because there were some really nice pictures taken of this morning's eclipse so perfect. All right onward Glenn onward onward, onward. and upward. Okay, a bunch of events occurring in the evening skies right now. Uh, 
we've got Venus and uh, Mars. And in the morning skies, we have Jupiter, Saturn, and uh, Mercury is going to make an appearance. And we start off on uh, tomorrow. Uh, Venus shines above and to the left of a 40-hour-old crescent moon. So that will be kind of an interesting challenge for you. It's be very low in the west-northwest, 40 minutes after sunset. So you need an open horizon. But if you've ever seen a moon that's about two days old, it's just incredible how skinny it is, just a little sliver. So you, if, if nothing else, use Venus to help you locate that. But you're going to have to look very low. Uh, on the 13th, Mars will be near the moon after sunset. And on the 18th, there were a couple of uh, eclipses of, of moons. Are, these are mutual events of Jupiter's moons. And I got this out of sky and telescope. So I put these down for those who might be interested. Um, but on Friday, June 18th, between 1.26 and 1.55 in the morning, uh, Europa is going to eclipse Io. And that'll be about a, about a half magnitude drop in brightness. So that might be something some of you might want to look to. Maybe you imagers especially might want to try that one out. On the 20th of June at 11.32 p.m., summer solstice, so the days start getting shorter again for us astronomers. Monday the 21st, another uh, uh, Jupiter moon event. From 2.13 to 2.17 in the morning, Io is going to eclipse Europa. There'll be about an eighth of a tenth magnitude drop, so almost a magnitude. And this next one, Wednesday the 23rd, this might be a good one for binoculars and small scopes or wide field scopes. Mars will be right in the middle of the beehive cluster. That's on the 23rd, but you might want to look a night or two before just to kind of check things out because this is going to be very low uh, 90 minutes after sunset. You might want to go out the night before if it's clear just to make sure you're going to be able to see this event. And uh, that might be a fun event to look at. I don't know how close Mars will be to any of those stars, but if any of you saw that occultation of Epsilon Gemini years ago, uh, when Mars passed in front of that star, once they got close, it was amazing. You could actually see the motion of Mars, just like you would see from uh, uh, a lunar occultation. But this was slower and just very majestic. It was very, very exciting. So I don't know if that necessarily will happen, but it's just worth giving it a look-see. And I'm sure we got a second page of these. We do. Okay. Uh, Jupiter double shadow transit. This will be Io and Callisto. This is on Saturday the 26th. Again, Jupiter events right now are in the morning sky. Uh, but the good news is, at least uh, I don't know about the uh, the Jupiter mutual events, but as far as the double shadow transits, I went through the uh, um, observer's handbook, and they're all they're happening every month right through to the end of the year. So there'll be a lot of them occurring. Not all of them will be visible at the time we're out there, but there will be a lot of them. So this will be uh, the first of a batch of them. Uh, Saturn is going to be near a waning gibbous moon on the 27th and uh, the 28th, uh, another eclipse. This is Io eclipsing Europa and this would be almost a full magnitude drop. This is the 28th in the morning, 433 to 436. And you know, I haven't been getting up that early. I'm, I'm retired. So my, my wake up time now is uh, uh, any time between sunrise and sunset, somewhere in there, I'll wake up and get out of bed. So that might be, it might already be too bright at that particular time, but I put it down there just in case. Uh, on Monday and Tuesday, the 28th and 29th, on both those mornings, Jupiter will be uh, shining right next to a, wa a waning gibbous moon. On the 4th of July, Mercury will be at its greatest western elongation. This will be low in the sky, be in east-northeast about 40 minutes before sunrise. And then four uh, mornings later, uh, Mercury is going to be just to the right of a very thin waning crescent moon. I'm not sure of how old or how far away it'll be from new moon, but this will be another skinny fingernail moon. So it might be kind of nice to give those a try. And that's it for the uh, events coming up. A lot well, of them. The mutual events of, of Jupiter satellites, I don't know if folks have ever seen those before, but um, as Jupiter orbits the sun uh, nearly once every nearly 12 years, um, uh, twice during that time, um, we see the plane of the, the moons of Jupiter edge on, um, just like the way we see the rings of Saturn edge on twice each revolution around the sun. And that's why mutual events are taking place now. We're looking at the plane of the satellites edge on. And so their shadows are, and they, they eclipse each other and they are covered by the shadows and, and they're kind of fun to watch. Um, imagers, yes, go for it. Christopher Go just published uh, a, a few days ago, uh, a, a spectacular um, image of the shadow of, I, now I can't remember which moons they were, but the shadow of one moon crossing uh, the other moon. So they're pretty good. And you, I don't know if you realize this, but. Um, around um, opposition, especially later this summer, 
um, the moons of those four big Galilean satellites are all easily resolved in backyard telescopes. Um, if you've got steady skies, um, you can actually see them as disks. They're about a second of an arc. So that's, it's quite possible to see them as disks. So they're fun to watch. And uh, of course, as we get deeper into the summer, right now, Jupiter is transiting the meridian at about six in the morning. Um, and so as we get through the summer and into the fall, I'll start publishing out my um, uh, prediction, not my predictions, but the predictions for when the great red spot will be visible and for when shadow transits take place to try to give you a heads up on some of that stuff. So a lot of fun looking at Jupiter, it changes all the time. Um, I, like I said earlier, I had a great look at it this morning, um, waiting for the sun to come up. All right, moving on, Glenn. Yes, moving our uh, observer's challenge for the month, uh, NGC 5746, and this is a, uh, an edge-on barred spiral galaxy. It's in the constellation Virgo. And uh, the, the finder chart shows it here. If you look over in the very uh, left corner there, that little box around there, that star that's circled there, that's uh, 109 Virgo. And in the inset chart there, that, that large black blob is 109 Virginis. And that whole little bo box there is about a half a degree across. So we're looking at about 20 arc minutes uh, over a little bit to the west of that star, you'll pick this galaxy up. And in fact, what I did myself was I just centered my telescope on 109 uh, Virginis. And then I just noted the way the sky was drifting. And of course, everything's moving to the west. So I looked, I, I put my scope so was, I was ahead of the star. And then I looked for a little fuzzy patch. And I finally did find it in pretty much the area that you see right there in that finder chart. Uh, the galaxy, by the way, you're talking a pretty good distance, about 95 million miles away, uh, magnitude about 10.3. So it's reasonably bright, but it's very thin. And it's something like a seven and a half by one and a half arc minutes in size. And it's very similar uh, to the Sombrero Galaxy M104, uh, NGC 4565, which is around this time of year. And then uh, the Twilight Zone Galaxy, NGC 891, all just spectacular edge on galaxies. Next slide. That asterism of stars, the, the, this, this group of stars over here, yeah, make it yeah. relatively easy to find because this, like you said, this is a, a small patch of sky. So if you can find this guy, you can find these guys in the galaxies right there. So, and those sense. those those stars will appear in the next two pictures. They appear. Uh, we got pictures by Doug Paul right here. Well, he's got the the lowermost of the star. We'll go to the next. That's uh, the one that uh, Doug Paul took of this galaxy, and the next. And I compared these. This is Mario Mata's image with his 32 inch scope. And the inset again, that's the sketch I made with the 10 inch scope. And the scale is very similar, but you notice right away, if you look at mine and then you look at Mario's, which goes almost up to those stars and that asterism you're talking about, Rich. That's these guys here. Yeah, and then you look at mine and basically you can tell all I got was basically that lower part of the, but below the dust lane, that very bright part of the galaxy's core in Mario's pictures, about all I could see with a 10 inch scope. So I wasn't able to see dust lanes. Now, again, I was observing with a 10 inch scope under magnitude five skies. So I would like to think that if I get to a place like Stellafane or even dark, you probably start to make out a little more. I, I thought with averted vision, I could see this galaxy extending a little bit beyond, but I really couldn't be sure. I also, by the way, was able to glimpse it with a four and a half inch scope, but that was definitely averted vision and knowing exactly where to look, but it was visible with a small aperture scope. It was pretty faint in my 10 inch. Um but it was definitely there. Um, and I've got about magnitude 4.8 skies. So it's, it, it is yeah. a challenge. It's not, it's not uh, hard to find it. It's hard to see it. So, uh, but you should Glenn, challenge before yourself. You get off that photo. Uh, notice in the center of this galaxy, the core, it's, right it's almost like an X going through the galaxy. Yeah, right there like that, like that. See that? Yep. I thought it was an art, uh, uh, Proston artifact at first and it drove me crazy, but apparently it's real. And I think it's an active core mm. um, with uh, outflowing gas, which wow. makes it kind of interesting. Yeah, that does. Well, that's pretty cool. We'll have to see if we can spot that. I, I, I don't know that you could see it visually, but it, I can see it definitely in your image, Mario. And again, you know, Mario's images go pretty deep. Some of these stars here <laughs> are 16th magnitude stars right here. So, you know, this is what you're normally going to see in your, in your telescope. And, and the, gal the core of the galaxy is more likely what you'll see, but the rest of the faint, faint stuff, not possible. Not possible. Um, awesome. And I think that's, that's it, Glenn, it. right? I think so that's it. So as always, keep looking up. Thanks, Glenn. Yes, indeed, we will. Tonight's speaker is Jeff Chester. His, the title of his talk is Sky and Ocean Joined, A Brief History of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Jeff is the public affairs officer and historian 
for the United States Naval Observatory in Washington, DC, a post he has held since 1997. Prior to joining the observatory staff, he spent 19 years working in the Albert Einstein Planetarium at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum as staff astronomer, photographer, and visual production coordinator. He has always had a keen interest in astronomy. Jeff and I go way back to our days in Aldrich back in the 1970s um, and has been actively observing the sky for more than 50 years. He is a member of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, the International Dark Sky Association, and the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. By a curious quirk of history, his great-grandfather, Rear Admiral Colby M. Chester, was the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory from 1902 to 1906. He was the fourth superintendent to live in the Quarters A, uh, the house that is now the official residence of the Vice President of the United States. And Jeff said there was no nepotism involved um, because um, Jeff's great-grandfather passed away 20 years before Jeff was even a thought. So without further ado, I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and I am going to let Jeff Chester share his screen. You still with us, Jeff? I'm still here. Excellent. Why don't you go ahead and share your screen? All righty. And let's start this. Okay. Hopefully, there we are. Okay. So, uh, as Rich said, uh, we've we we actually do go way back. Um, in fact, uh, maybe this will give you an idea of just how far back we go. Uh, Rich probably remembers me more like the guy on the left. Uh, this was Stella Fane in 1976. Uh, I was uh, with the Aldrich Club at the time, Aldrich Astronomical Society, and we were exhibiting a restored three-inch Meritz Uchnieder und Fraunhofer refractor. Uh, that had been, uh, that belonged to my brother-in-law, actually. I don't know quite how he got it or why he got it, um, but it was uh, lovingly restored by Mario Antonucci and a number of other folks from the Aldrich Club. Um, but uh, about a year after that, I moved down to Washington, uh, managed to get a job at the Air and Space Museum and the Planetarium there. And uh, after 19 years at Air and Space, uh, the position opened up for the public affairs officer at the Naval Observatory, and uh, it was a natural progression for me to uh, step up there because, for one thing, uh, I finally had access to a bigger telescope. Um, so uh, that's where I've been, and uh, it really is a pretty remarkable place. Trying to find a way to talk about it uh, in a relatively brief time uh, is, is a bit of a daunting task because the observatory as an institution has been around for uh, really a very long time. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, we can actually look at the date of, uh, of uh, December 6th, 1830 as the date of the establishment of what is now the United States Naval Observatory. It was on that date that the gentleman on the left, Lieutenant Lewis M. Goldsboro, received orders from the Secretary of the Navy to establish in Washington a depot for the proper care, repair, and most importantly, rating of all of the Navy's navigational instruments, most importantly, the marine chronometers. Chronometers, as you probably know, were uh, developed in the uh, 18th century and performed a vital function uh, in terms of celestial navigation. At the time, the Navy had a total of about two dozen chronometers in their possession. And in those days, uh, new chronometers were not available in the United States. There were no uh, clock makers or instrument makers that had the chops to build them. So we had to purchase all of them. Uh, and they mostly came from England and other places in Europe. So uh, in order to uh, make sure that chronometers lasted a long time, you had to take very good care of them. Um, the other thing about a chronometer is that you don't necessarily know how well it's keeping time unless you can compare it to a time scale of known precision. 
Now today at the observatory, we have clocks that are capable of maintaining a day-to-day -day precision that's measured on the femtosecond level. Uh, needless to say, that technology wasn't available in 1830. Uh, in fact, the only really good time scale that was available for people to calibrate clocks was the time scale that was determined by the mean rotation rate of the Earth itself. So it follows that if you are going to establish a place that's going to be basically calibrating chronometers, you have to build an astronomical observatory in order to be able to do that. Well, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, established the depot uh, by his order of December 6th, 1830. And he gave Gil, uh, Goldsboro um, a annual budget of $330 for fiscal year 1831. 250 of that had to go to rent for a building. Uh, and the rest of it basically covered his expenses to go to various Navy yards and bring chronometers that weren't on ships at sea back to the depot. Uh, which left him no money for instruments. But Goldsboro was a pretty much, a, he was kind of a wheeler dealer guy uh, and he had friends in high places. So he was able to wangle instruments from the Coast Survey and a few other places uh, and set up shop and uh, basically had a pretty cushy job for the next couple of years. He was relieved in 1833 by Lieutenant Charles Wilkes uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Wilkes and his exploits in a few minutes. Um, and he in turn was relieved by Lieutenant James M. Gillis. And it was Gillis who really instituted the, uh, the, the, uh, the movement to establish a permanent naval observatory. So this was a map of Washington uh, as it appeared in uh, the early part of the 19th century. Um, the, uh, to give you an idea of uh, kind of the scale of things here, here's the Capitol right there. Um, and uh, here's the White House over here. Uh, this is Rock Creek, which uh, basically was the geographical barrier that limited the development of the city. Um, our first site was known as the G Street Depot. And that's right over here. It was a couple blocks from the White House. Uh, it actually in its day was located in a very sketchy part of town, so only big burly Navy officers would want to be running around there at night. Uh, the neighborhood's changed a little bit since then. Um, and uh, that was our home up until 1833. When Lieutenant Wilkes took over, uh, he decided he was going to move it up to his, uh, his backyard, essentially, uh, up near Capitol Hill. So it was located just to the north of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, it was a great location, except there was this big building. Uh, there was this big building with a dome on it that blocked off some of the southern uh, horizon, didn't interfere with the transit circle observations. Uh, and Gillis finally was the one who established the observatory in the site that became known as Foggy Bottom. Uh, and that was in 1842. So this is kind of a view of what Gillis uh, or of what the, the city looked like uh, from uh, the early 1830s. Uh, we think that this over here is actually Lieutenant Wilkes's house. He was a man of fairly independent means. Uh, interestingly, his mother passed away when he was young and he was raised by his aunt uh, who was a woman named Elizabeth Ann Seton. Elizabeth Ann Seton is, so far as I know, the only native-born American saint now. Uh, but you can see that there was this pretty dominant building up here on a hill, and it did tend to interfere a little bit with the view. Um, this is a transit instrument that was used by Wilkes. Uh, it was actually also used by uh, Goldsboro, um, and uh, was loaned to the depot and mounted at the Capitol Hill Observatory. Uh, along with a uh, good uh, working uh, sidereal clock over here. And it was with this instrument that Wilkes basically measured the transit times of certain stars, which today we still call clock stars. And these are some of his transit measurements. We have some of these uh, still left in our archives dating back to uh, 1836. 
Now, Wilkes was a very interesting character. In uh, 1838, he took leave of the observatory to command the United States Exploration Expedition. Uh, he was the uh, captain of a ship called the USS Vincennes and was in command of two other ships in the expedition. And they spent four years sailing around the Pacific Basin over here. In fact, they circumnavigated the world as well. Uh, during this time, he had a number of scientists and botanists and other uh, folks like that aboard. Uh, and they collected an enormous number of specimens. Uh, however, he tended to be a little harsh on his crew. Uh, so when he got back stateside, he was court-martialed. Uh, for basically beating up some of his uh, crew members. Um, and uh, ultimately he was acquitted. Uh, but what happened was there was this enormous collection of stuff that he brought back with him. Um, now, uh, John Quincy Adams at this point in time uh, was a uh, member of the House of Representatives from Massachusetts. He had uh, uh, the only, uh, only uh, president who subsequently served in Congress, he had always championed the idea of a national observatory. So he uh, lobbied very heavily in uh, the early 1840s for the establishment of a naval observatory. Uh, but he didn't have friends in Congress. Uh, and instead, they lobbied to go and take the funds that were left by this a uh, British fellow by the name of James Smithson and establish an institution for the increase in diffusion of knowledge. Um, and the ultimate or the, the, the perfect situation was that they had just come back with all these uh, specimens and artifacts and things that they collected on this four year expedition. So uh, they decided that it would be appropriate to start the Smithsonian collection with those, uh, with, with, with those items. Um, now, Lieutenant Gillis, who is now in charge of the observatory, uh, was obviously crestfallen. He wanted to have uh, an observatory established with congressional approval, um, and it didn't happen. But fortunately, he was able to lobby a senator from South Carolina um, who happened to have, his son happened to be uh, going, happened to go over to the observatory, Capitol Hill, uh, and saw the tiny little telescope there and basically complained to his dad that we didn't have any telescopes that were worth spit. Uh, so Preston got with Gillis and together they hammered out uh, a deal where uh, Preston would introduce legislation into Congress to establish funds for a permanent naval observatory. And here is a copy of the bill uh, that was entered into the Senate and on June 22nd, 1842. Uh, and you will see that it has uh, a plan not exceeding in cost the sum of $25,000. Well, this was just, you know, this, this was a, a more than enough uh, to give us a, uh, a, a good place to start. Um, so Gillis uh, basically designed the buildings that uh, the instruments were going to go into. He contracted with manufacturers in Europe to build the instruments. The one thing that he didn't have a choice over was the location. It's always location. Uh, and the, that, lo that decision was left up to President John Tyler. Um, John Tyler was the first vice president to su succeed a president who uh, died in office. Uh, and all things being equal, he never really wanted to be president, but there he was kind of stuck with the job. Uh, and he saw that there was this hill uh, just uh, on, on the south side of Washington, DC, right on the banks of the Potomac. He said, let's put it over there. Uh, I don't know whether anybody mentioned to him that the neighborhood was commonly known as Foggy Bottom, but that was the site that was chosen. And so that was the site that was decided upon. And that was where the observatory was completed. So this is an idea of what it looked like uh, at the Foggy Bottom site in 1845. 
what you don't see are the surrounding swamplands. Uh, this was basically right on the banks of the Potomac River. Uh, this is a view from the north. If you went about three blocks to the south, you would find yourself standing up to your neck in unspeakable muck and mire because that was uh, a, uh, a, 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 essentially the banks of the river. Uh, and it also happened to be uh, where most of the septic systems for the city drained into. So it was a, a terrible place. But um, Gillis nonetheless persevered, saw the building completed, uh, ordered the instruments, saw the instruments delivered, fully expected that he was going to be named as the first superintendent of the new Naval Observatory. But unfortunately for him, we got a new secretary of the Navy in 1844. He was a Virginian and he wanted a Virginia Naval officer to be in charge of the depot. So he tapped uh, Lieutenant Matthew Fontaine Maury to become the superintendent. And Maury would have been superintendent for life, but in April of 1861, there was this little disagreement between uh, the Southern states and the Northern states and Maury being from Virginia decided to, uh, decided to resign his commission in uh, the Federal Navy, uh, walked across the bridge to Virginia and gave his services to the Confederacy. Uh, by default, Gillis wound up eventually getting the job. So some of the instruments uh, were really state-of-the-art instruments of the day. Uh, and as you can see, most of them were uh, made in uh, Europe. Uh, we had a number of transit instruments, uh, a Mertz and Mahler with a five inch Ertel lens, a 4.1 4 uh, inch trout transit at uh, Troughton and Sims uh, mural circle that's in the background. Um, a uh, Pister and Martin's prime vertical instrument and uh, the great telescope, the, the 9.6 inch Mertz and Mahler. This was actually built as uh, essentially a copy of Fraunhofer's great 9.6 inch Dorpat refractor. Uh, and this was the main instrument that was used at the observatory uh, for the next uh, oh, 12 years or so, or 20 years. Um, this gentleman, uh, James Ferguson, was really kind of our first outstanding astronomer. Um, he was actually a, an immigrant to the United States, uh, had no formal education, but he was a prolific observer with the 9.6 inch telescope. He discovered the first asteroid from the United States, 31 Euphrosyne. Uh, and uh, also discovered two other asteroids, uh, number 50 Virginia and 60 Echo. Uh, for those, he was awarded the Lalonde Prize of the French Academy of Sciences twice, and he published over 90 papers during his career, more than any other uh, pre-Civil War American astronomer. Um, he passed away in 1867, but before he did so, the Naval Observatory hired uh, this gentleman right over here, um, Asaph Hall. Asaph Hall had been working for $3 a week as an instructor at Harvard College Observatory, decided that there were better pastures if he moved further south. Uh, he was able to obtain a position as an assistant astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory in 1862. And on August 22nd, 1863, uh, was observing with the 9.6 inch telescope when uh, there was a knock on the door of the telescope and he opened it up and up came Abraham Lincoln along with a number of other uh, people from the cabinet. Um, and the gentleman exchanged pleasantries. Uh, Hall showed Lincoln the moon, which was a crescent at the time and the bright star Arcturus through the telescope uh, and the official party left and Hall went back to work. Um, now there are a couple of variations on the story. One is that a couple of nights later, uh, Lincoln came by all by himself walking over alone from the White House, which is uh, 16th in Pennsylvania and this is 24th street. So it was about eight blocks. Um, 
walked over by himself. Uh, another story says that he came by at two o'clock the same morning that uh, he had first met Hall, but he had a burning question in his mind and he couldn't get to sleep until he knew what the answer was. So uh, he knocked on the door once again. Uh, Hall was used to people kind of coming and going at all odd hours of the night. Uh, and so he kept a, a desk over the trap door so that people wouldn't barge in on him. Um, the knocking was very persistent. Hall finished his observation. He went and he moved the desk out of the way, opened up the trap door and up came a stovepipe hat underneath of which was Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln had a burning question in his mind and that was why did the moon look backwards than it does uh, in the sky? And uh, in a previous life, of course, Lincoln had been a surveyor. And if you look through a theodolite, you see a fully erect image. Uh, Hall explained to him that astronomers don't like all that extra glass between them and what they're looking at. They want to keep the optics as simple as possible and that a telescope lens fully inverts an astronomical image. Uh, a, a supposedly, Lincoln was satisfied with that explanation. Uh, went back to the White House uh, and did come on a few other occasions to visit with Hall. And his son, Robert Todd Lincoln, became a very frequent uh, visitor to the observatory um, and actually did some of his own observing with the telescope there. Uh, ultimately, uh, when he built his house, Hildeen, up in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, he built an observatory that was equipped with a very nice six inch Warner and Swayze refractor. So Ace of Hall and Lincoln became very good friends uh, and this became legend in Naval Observatory uh, lore. Well, this gives you kind of an idea of what Washington looked like around 1861. Uh, the new dome for the Capitol was being constructed over here. And the observatory is this little thing that you can see right up here on this hilltop. Now, uh, a couple of things to note. First of all, there is this canal, which goes down from Capitol Hill and flows out right by the observatory. Uh, and there is a, another creek called Tiber Creek, which you don't see very well in this drawing, but it kind of flows down in this general direction here and empties out into this area right in here. Uh, this, as it turns out, was the biggest open sewer in the city. Uh, and it was to the east of the observatory. Uh, there was also a considerable amount of effluent that flowed down this canal to the south. So in short, the observatory was surrounded by uh, very unpleasant conditions, especially in the summertime. If you've ever spent any time down here in July and August, you'll understand why most sensible people leave town still. Um, this posed a number of issues that had to do with the health of the observers. Malaria was rampant. Uh, it was really a terrible place to do astronomy from. But astronomy persevered uh, over the course of the uh, years after the Civil War, during and after the Civil War. Uh, we had a number of uh, important people who served there. Admiral Charles Henry Davis uh, was the superintendent of the Nautical Almanac office when it was up in Cambridge. That was moved down to Washington in 1865, became a department of the observatory. Uh, and uh, Professor Simon Newcomb came along with it. Newcomb is probably or generally considered to be uh, the most prominent American scientist of uh, the 19th century even though he was Canadian. In 1870, or in the early 1870s, um, Newcomb was lamenting the fact that there were uh, colleges and high schools and even some private individuals who had bigger and better telescopes than the US Naval Observatory. So he took his case to Rear Admiral Benjamin Franklin Sands uh, who was the superintendent of the observatory immediately following Admiral Davis. And Sands recognized that this was a problem. Uh, so he went to his superiors in the Navy and he lobbied with them uh, with the idea that the Naval Observatory should obtain the largest refracting telescope in the world. 
And the Navy said, okay, we'll take that to Congress and see how it flies. And ultimately Congress approved $50,000 for the purchase of this telescope on the condition that it be made entirely by American craftsmen uh, and that again, it come in at a cost of $50,000 or less. So the firm of Alvin Clark and Sons uh, built the 26 inch great equatorial as it was known. Uh, and it was duly installed at the Naval Observatory in 1873. Um, it was not the best place to put a telescope like this. We have records of uh, the number of nights when it could be used to its full capacity from that time frame, And uh, in many of the years, uh, those numbers were maybe a dozen to, oh, 30 or 40 nights in a year. But we had a number of observers who were uh, indefatigable in their use of it. And again, we have to come to our friend Asaph Hall. Uh, Asaph Hall spent uh, and got, uh, basically was put in charge of the Great Equatorial starting in 1876. And right off the bat, he observed a bright white spot in the atmosphere of Saturn. And he was able to time transits of that spot over the Saturnian central meridian. And he was able to determine the revolution time of Saturn uh, for the very first time. It was, it, was, it was really nailed down. And his value came out to be uh, within a few minutes of the accepted value today. So he was bolstered by this and realized that there was an exceptional opposition of Mars coming up in 1877. Um, so he decided that he was going to uh, look for uh, moons of the planet. Um, now, the previous opposition in 1875, uh, a number of people, Henry Draper and so on, had taken photographs of Mars, hoping to detect a, a moon photographically. And of course, Mars blooms out photographs. So uh, it didn't show, they didn't show anything that were, you know, close to Mars, uh, relatively close to Mars at a distance like the apparent distance like the Jovian satellites are from the disk of Jupiter. Uh, so Hall decided that he was going to look in very close to the planet. Uh, he must have read Gulliver's Travels. Anyway, uh, on August 11th, he found Deimos, the first of the two Martian satellites. For the next several nights, uh, he would uh, be frustrated by the weather. As soon as he'd get to the telescope, it would cloud over. Um, but finally, on the evening of August 17th, he was able to once again find Deimos. And while he was taking measurements of Deimos, Phobos appeared. Uh, so this is a copy, or this is actually the uh, original logbook of Hall's discovery at that time. Uh, and you'll see up here it says uh, Mars stars. Um, and down here it says both of the above objects seen uh, by G. Anderson and myself. George Anderson was his observing assistant. Well, uh, he told the, his superiors at the observatory, obviously, uh, that morning, about what he had found that previous night. And of course, we know it's not real until the boss sees it. So the next entrance or the next entry in the observing log uh, is uh, with all the brass of the observatory, the top scientists there making their measurements uh, and their observations. And you'll notice there's a cryptic note at the bottom here. It said Newcomb made the observations on this page. So if Newcomb saw it, it had to be real. Um, and just to give you an idea of how difficult it is to see it, this is an image of Mars that I took with our 12 inch telescope. Uh, there's Phobos there uh, just outside the glow of Mars and I've superimposed a uh, filtered image of Mars there to give you an idea of the, just how close Phobos is uh, to that planet. Well, this caused an international sensation and put the Naval Observatory on the map. Uh, it was also during this time that the Naval Observatory organized uh, eight expeditions to observe the transits of Venus in 1874 and 1882. So there are a number of astronomical luminaries here. Uh, there's Asa Hall, there's Simon Newcomb, there's Henry Draper, this is uh, CFH Peters, 
Uh, and uh, there's a few other folks here. I can't remember who and where they are, but uh, these were all folks setting up outside the dome of the 26 inch telescope uh, just before shipping out for the 1874 transit. This was considered to be uh, a key scientific expedition because for the first time, it would allow us to determine the, the value of the astronomical unit. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that in the latter part of the 19th century, we still didn't know quite how big the solar system was. Uh, so uh, we sent off these expeditions uh, to make those measurements. Uh, they were equipped with instruments made by Alvin Clark. Uh, and finally, after the two expeditions, uh, this gentleman, Professor William Harkness, was able to come up with the first really good estimate on uh, the size of the solar system. But Foggy Bottom proved to be, well, Foggy Bottom. Uh, a number of staff tended to get sick every year. We actually had two superintendents who died as a result of malaria contracted while working there. Uh, and so starting in the 18, uh, 1881, uh, the observatory uh, or the Navy purchased a 75 acre farm in the hills above Georgetown. Uh, somehow they were able to hire Richard Morris Hunt, who was considered to be the Dean of 19th century American architects. Uh, if you've been down to Newport and admired some of those quaint little summer cottages on the ocean walk there, like the breakers, uh, he's the guy. Uh, and this was the building, uh, uh, the building complex that he ultimately designed uh, for Georgetown Heights, uh, our present location today. So uh, we have uh, the, the library is in here. Uh, there's the dome with the 12 inch telescope. There's the 26 inch telescope and the transit circles and timing houses are back over here in this area. Uh, the site has grown considerably since then. We've got a lot more trees now uh, and a lot more buildings, but this gives you an idea of what the view was like right when we first occupied the site in 1893. Um, the only instrument that moved with us was the 26 inch and the only part of the 26 inch that moved with us was uh, the objective lens itself. Uh, we hired Warner and Swayze to build the new mounting for the 26 inch that you see on the left. Uh, and this is actually a picture, it says 1920, this is actually a picture from uh, 1893 from uh, a book of uh, Warner and Swayze's astronomical instruments. Uh, the lens has only been taken apart and cleaned uh, three times that I am aware of. Uh, one was when it was reassembled in the new telescope. Uh, the other one was uh, for uh, this picture that was taken in the 1960s. And it was recently uh, cleaned and remounted uh, a couple of years ago with uh, a major upgrade to the mounting of the telescope. Uh, Warner and Swayze also built our six inch transit circle. This is the first all steel transit circle that was ever built. Uh, this instrument was in continuous use from 1899 up through the early 1990s. It made its last official observation on the day after the centennial of its first. So we can honestly say it was in use for over a hundred years. Today, you will find it in uh, the main lobby of the Great Hall of the main observatory building. And we decided to put it in there because otherwise it would have been boxed up and shipped off to that warehouse that you see in all those Indiana Jones pictures. Here's the 12 inch Clark Sagmuller Equatorial. It's a beautiful telescope. Uh, it was in use through about uh, the, uh, 1957. Uh, it was then dismounted, uh, scattered in pieces around the grounds of the observatory. Uh, and it was reassembled in 1980 by two of our staff astronomers. Uh, and uh, it still provides beautiful views uh, for visual and photographic uh, use for the, the moon and planets. Uh, and it's available for essentially for recreational use of the staff. Uh, we also had a 15 inch Warner and Swayze astrograph. Um, this was something of a, something of a white elephant. Um, the lens was made by uh, Robert Lundeen, who was the son of Carl Lundeen, who was the head optician at the 
Clark works uh, in the latter part of their heyday. Um, Robert Lundeen was able to, he made fantastic uh, achromatic two element lenses. Uh, this was a Cook triplet and it was the first one that he was commissioned to grind and polish and it never really turned out so well. Um, it went back and forth to the Warner and Swayze works at least six times. And then the superintendent finally just said, the hell with it, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, it spent most of its career actually stopped down to about eight inches, but it was used for uh, taking astrometric plates to measure the positions of asteroids. Now, the observatory's main mission was still time. Uh, and timing is, uh, up until fairly recently, was still done astronomically. So uh, we had on the hill just to the west of the main building, uh, the two transit circle houses. Uh, we had the six inch Warner and Swayze transit in here and a nine inch transit in here that came up from Foggy Bottom. Uh, in the middle was uh, the clock house. It was in here in the basement of this building uh, in a concrete lined vault that we kept our ultra precise uh, pendulum clocks. Uh, and these were calibrated every day by observations made with the transit circles. Uh, you can see there's actually uh, a little periscope that allows, or there's, you can't see it in this picture, but there was actually a periscope that allowed people to look at the clocks uh, in the vault without actually having to go into the vault to disturb them. Uh, you know, but uh, it's the Navy. I guess they, they can do periscopes. Um, that time in turn was passed to uh, a transmitting clock, which distributed time over uh, the telegraph, which we began in, uh, we began that service in the 1870s and continued it actually up through the 1960s. It was also where we rated chronometers. And you can see here uh, a whole bunch of chronometers on uh, the wall over here. And there's a number of them that are in this table down here. Uh, the chronometers would be compared with time displayed on these clocks, which received electrical signals from the master clock in the clock house. Uh, and we could then determine the running rates of each of these instruments before we sent them off to sea. Now, uh, timing improved with uh, invention of better and better clocks. And in order to help calibrate these clocks, we had to come up with a better way of measuring where stars were in the sky, specifically when they crossed the meridian, that was better than uh, what the human eye could do. So we came up with a device called a photographic zenith tube. And this is basically a telescope that stares straight up into the sky and a uh, clock trips a, photograph, trips a shutter on a photographic plate when it thinks that a star is crossing the meridian. Uh, we can then develop the plate and measure the error in the position of the star from the center of the plate, which is where the meridian line is. And from that, we can then determine the error in our clocks and we can then calibrate them. Uh, so it's a very clever way of uh, sort of eliminating the human equation uh, in the time factor. And of course, as we got through the 1930s and up into the early 1950s and 60s, we began to get better and better oscillators. Uh, we were one of the first people to install quartz crystal clocks and also one of the first institutions to adopt atomic frequency standards. Uh, today, the second is actually defined by an atomic frequency. Uh, and the clocks that we operate today are all atomic frequency standards of various types. Um, the frequency standard was, uh, had to be linked though with the astronomical time scale. Uh, and we had an astronomer, very clever man named William Markowitz who figured out a way to do that. Uh, the ephemera second is defined as uh, a fraction of the time it takes the earth to go once around the sun in a particular epoch year. Uh, Markowitz realized that you couldn't measure the position of stars next to the sun in the sky, but you could measure positions of the stars near the moon. 
The only problem is, is that the moon moves appreciably during the course of the time it takes to make an exposure. So he developed what was called the dual rate moon camera, which allowed uh, the moon to essentially be frozen uh, while you made an exposure uh, of stars in the background. And eight sets of these instruments were deployed around the world. And from observations that were uh, begun in the 1950s, uh, up through the early 1960s, he was able to establish a link between the ephemeris second and the frequency of the cesium atom, which is today how we determine uh, the duration of the second. Now today, we have state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, we operate uh, about 100 atomic clocks, uh, and since we operate about one third of the world's operational clocks, we essentially account for about one third of the international weighting that goes into the international determination of the second. However, uh, a few years ago, the demands for next generation GPS came down from our uh, DOD overlords. And we realized that the clock system that we had was getting, eh, they were getting pretty close to the best that that could deliver. So we went to private industry and said, we need something that would be one or two orders of magnitude better than what we're able to produce now. And they said, yeah, we could do that. How much money do you have? Um, the price they quoted was about double our annual operating budget. So we decided that it would be easier to hire uh, four atomic physicists and have them design in our instrument shop build these, which is, uh, or this device, which is our rubidium fountain clock. Uh, the heart and soul of this is a, uh, uh, is based on a Nobel prize that was awarded to this gentleman over here, Dr. William Phillips, who along with Dr. Stephen Chu, uh, developed a way to use lasers to trap and cool uh, atoms to extremely low temperatures. And when you get them that, when, when you can get them that cold, uh, you can manipulate them at very, very low velocity uh, and measure their frequencies over much longer periods of time within the device. Uh, so it turns out this gentleman here, Dr. Steve Peel, who is uh, head of our clock development department now, was a graduate student of Dr. Phillips. So uh, we were very lucky to have people like him working for us. Uh, we have six of these devices that we built in-house. Four of them are in Washington. Two of them are at our alternate master clock facility in Colorado. Uh, and when we do intercomparison between any two of these clocks uh, over the course of a day, they will not deviate by, uh, from each other by more than about uh, a femtosecond, which is pretty darn small. So speaking of time, uh, these are all the various time scales that we have to keep track of. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is the one that's important for most of us these days is atomic time up here. Uh, I will, uh, I think this is being recorded so uh, you can come back and uh, see the recording of it if you really wanna dive into the nitty gritty of timing. But this is one of the things that uh, we are really, really good at. Um, these are some key dates in standard uh, time in the United States. Um, and uh, this just goes up. I, I put this in here because twice a year, we have to set our clocks forward or backward uh, unless you live in Arizona or Hawaii. Um, and I get a lot of hate mail uh, because of this. Um, so I put this up there just to show who to lay the blame on squarely in the, in the hands of Congress. Uh, and uh, enforcement of uh, law uh, has to be carried out by a civilian agency. So if you don't like daylight time or the way time zones are laid out or anything like that, don't, please, please don't call me. Don't, don't complain to us. It's not our department. We keep one time coordinated universal time. We don't tell people what to do with it. Uh, but if you have a beef, call the Department of Transportation because they are the people that actually get to deal with this problem. 
So today, the footprint of the observatory is spread uh, quite, a, quite a ways around the country. Uh, the headquarters are here in Washington. We have our alternate master clock facility uh, co-located at Trever Space Force Base now out in uh, Colorado Springs. And we have a uh, Flagstaff station out in Flagstaff, Arizona, and a VLBI antenna, which is part of a global network uh, in Koki Park, Hawaii. We also have a uh, optical interferometer, which is at the Anderson Mesa station of Lowell Observatory out in Flagstaff. Uh, so this is the U.S. Naval Observatory headquarters today um, and uh, hasn't changed too much since the 1800s. Uh, there's just a little bit more shrubbery and trees around. And here is our station out in Flagstaff. The Flagstaff station is where we have our big telescopes, uh, the 61-inch Chi-Strand Astrometric Reflector. Uh, this is a Newtonian Cassegrain, for those of you who are uh, optically interested. Uh, it operates at F10, and it is used for measuring stellar parallax. Uh, it was designed right from the get-go with that purpose in mind. Uh, we also have out there the 40-inch Ritchie Chrétien telescope that was originally installed in Washington. This was the last telescope that George Willis Ritchie ever built. Uh, and the finder scope on it is one of the Alvin Clark 5-inch Transit of Venus telescopes. Uh, so there's a fair amount of history that's uh, done in this. This instrument is used for uh, astrometry of faint asteroids uh, and um, various uh, uh, other types of uh, variable objects. The one point or the 61 inch telescope was the telescope that was used to discover Charon, the moon of Pluto. Uh, there were two plates that were taken uh, a couple of days apart. And this gentleman here, Jim Christie, back in Washington, was analyzing the plates so he could make astrometric measurements to derive an orbit for Pluto for the almanac. And he noticed that there was a lump that appeared on the side of uh, some of the plates. And three days later, that lump would appear down here. And otherwise, it looked like this in between. Uh, so he and this gentleman up here, Dr. Bob Harrington, uh, basically compared all of the observations that they had, uh, and Harrington was able to derive uh, an orbital rotation period of uh, a little over three days, uh, and the first uh, predictions of mutual occultation and eclipses between these two bodies. And once those were observed, we were able to uh, derive the sizes of both objects, uh, and from that, we were able to derive the masses of the two objects combined. And it was this discovery that essentially killed Pluto. Uh, and I still get hate mail for that. Um, oddly enough, our busiest telescope is uh, a transit circle, which is uh, an eight inch transit circle out at the Flagstaff station. Uh, this is used for very rapid astrometry before there are asteroidal occultations. Those of you who are members of IOTA uh, and go chasing asteroid occultations, the astrometry that you're using uh, to narrow down the path of the occultation uh, probably came from this instrument. Uh, this is fully robotic and operates every night uh, and produces an enormous amount of data. Um, one of the other things that we do is uh, establish where things are in the sky. Uh, it's all well and good to know uh, which way is up and down and right and left and all that. But unless you have a reference frame, uh, it's really hard to pin down exactly where things are and more importantly, where things are going. So one of the other things that we are charged with is observing and maintaining what is known as the International Celestial Reference Frame. Uh, we do this in conjunction with a number of radio observatories using VLBI. Uh, the VLBI data gets sent to the observatory in Washington. We have what is essentially a dedicated supercomputer, which will uh, correlate observations from these various individual telescopes. Uh, and we look at quasars. Uh, the quasars, of course, are so far away, they show virtually no motion on the plane of the sky. 
and they therefore form a really, really solid reference frame against which we can measure the positions of everything else in the universe, as well as the uh, idiosyncrasies in the Earth's rotation and its orientation in space. Uh, our research is evolving as well. Uh, we are constantly looking for better ways to do astrometry. Uh, so we are in, we have built and have operated for uh, since about uh, the late 1990s, the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer uh, at Anderson Mesa. Uh, this is a four array imaging interferometer and a six array astrometric interferometer. Uh, and this can be used to measure uh, very precise positions of uh, bright stars. Uh, from an imaging point of view, it can also be used to resolve extremely close double stars. So this is uh, the triple star system Eta Virginis. Uh, this is one of the first images that we got uh, with the combined beams of six telescopes and the angular separation between the two uh, objects here in the A component uh, is about 5.4 milliarc seconds. Uh, I always thought that resolving parama in uh, a four-inch telescope was a, was a good trick. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is going that a, a little bit better. We also map the sky and issue star catalogs. Uh, we have just completed our last major ground-based uh, sky survey, uh, the U USNO Robotic Astrometric Telescope Survey, or URAT. Um, those of you who are imagers, the heart and soul of this is an array of four of these very large hybrid uh, CCD CMOS. I can't exactly call them chips. Uh, but uh, these are 112 megapixel sensors, uh, and there is a nice little like a point and shoot camera for comparison in the scale. We have four of those that go into the back of uh, or the front end of uh, what's called the four shooter camera, which is attached to the back of uh, what as once was a uh, off the shelf uh, Bowler and Shivens eight inch astrograph that has been heavily modified. Uh, this telescope operated remotely out in Flagstaff and down at Cerro Tololo to map the entire sky to 18th magnitude with a position uh, precision that is on the order of about 30 milliarc seconds for the faintest objects. And just to give you an idea of uh, just what this does for us, uh, this gives you, uh, this is uh, uh, a realization of uh, the data uh, of, on Messier 11, one of my favorite clusters, I'm sure one of yours too. Uh, this is how it's mapped in the Tico 2 star catalog, which was uh, derived from the original Hipparchos data in the late 1980s. Uh, this is the UCAC, which was the forerunner to the URAC catalog. Uh, it used a much smaller CCD on the same telescope that we used for URAT, um, that goes to about 113 million stars. Uh, and then finally, this is the same field realized with URAT in 2017. The total catalog has about 450 million stars, uh, positions of five to 30 milliarc seconds. So time and position, those are the things that we do today. Those are the things that uh, we are recognized around the world as the uh, essentially premier authority on. Uh, and um, it's been a long ride, but uh, we have uh, persevered and we look forward to having uh, another, well, let's see, we're coming up on our 190th anniversary. So maybe we'll have another 190 or so. Uh, and this finally is the seal of the observatory. Uh, we still use this as in our official correspondence and uh, in, in various places. Uh, it was designed by Admiral Charles Henry Davis in 1867. Uh, it uses a quote from the fourth book of the Astronomica by Manilius. Uh, and uh, the Latin motto translates to then to the pilot's care, the stars are scaled and sky with ocean joined. And with that, I think I'm done.
So if there's any questions, uh, fire away. Jeff, that was awesome. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was fantastic. I love thinking about the history of some of these great observatories that um, are still with us today. And um, I mentioned to you in an email that I had been looking at um, some of the lighting charts of DC back at the time when the observatory was moved up to, uh, up to Georgetown. Um, I, you know, when you look at the maps and you look where the Potomac River went and where it was then, and even if you look at some of the views of when the Lincoln Memorial was being constructed back in the, I think 1909-ish, um, the place was a swamp. Still is. A foggy bottom was a swamp, probably a malarial swamp. What a mess. I didn't oh, realize it was, those it was canals, terrible. I didn't realize the canals left what they did out there. Um, it's no wonder that they moved up the hill. And when I, and I imagine um, in 1893, up the hill to Georgetown was probably wilderness compared to the city. It was, um, yep. and it was, it was, uh, it was way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there were actually, it, it, interesting thing was that the, uh, the, the superintendent that we had who really instigated the move was uh, a mental, uh, Admiral John Rogers. Um, he was the son, uh, I mean, he, he came from a naval family that went back to, you know, before the Revolutionary War. And um, he realized that, you know, he had too many astronomers and, and folks that were either getting really sick or dropping dead at Foggy Bottom. Uh, and so he was the one who really began the initiative to move the place somewhere, somewhere else that was away from the swamps. So uh, he formed a committee and they looked at about 40 different sites around town. Uh, the reason that they ultimately chose the site we're on today was A, uh, it was owned by a family that uh, was named Barber, uh, which uh, had basically run the place as the plantation for years, but Mrs. Barber was tired of being out in the country and she wanted to move into the city in Georgetown. Uh, so she sold the property for cheap. Uh, so we picked up uh, 73 acres for about $60,000, I think it was. Uh, the other reason that the site was chosen was that it was the only place that they were able to test uh, using explosives uh, to see how the ground shook uh, with the idea that they wanted to have a good base to put telescopes on. Um, so uh, <laughs> you, know, you site tested in whatever way you could back in those days, I guess. But um, it was uh, ultimately chosen. Uh, and as I say, the land was purchased in 1881. Uh, in 1882, uh, Admiral Rogers uh, decided he was going to move into uh, the, the house vacated by the Barber family uh, to spend the summer so he would be away from Foggy Bottom. But before he had a chance to do that, uh, he caught malaria and died. So <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, those just, are some of the risks, right? Those are real risks back then. And, and yeah, I imagine. Ocu occupational hazard. Sure. I, you know, and when you look at the lighting charts of DC and you go back and look at, you know, the history of not electric, but illumination, early, early 1800s, it was all whale oil lamps and then they brought in natural gas. And, but by right. the, by about the 1890s, wasn't that when they were bringing in the electric lights? So I don't I wonder if that contributed also to the, the need to move. Well, the, it, it took them 12 years to get from, uh, to get from a, uh, essentially a blank piece of property uh, to the building that we're in today. Ah. Um, so uh, that probably wasn't a factor, at least in, in Admiral Rogers' mind. Um, the, the thing that there is, um, there, there's a photograph, big panoramic photograph that used to be down in the, uh, in, in the, the, the rotunda of the old 26 inch dome down at Foggy Bottom. Um, that showed the view of uh, that part of DC taken from the top of the Washington Monument when it was completed in 1885. And uh, it was, you know, it was this big eight by 10 glass plate negative. So they blew it up to a wall mural and had it plastered up on the side of the, uh, the wall of the uh, rotunda there. And uh, you can plainly see 
uh, the environment of the old observatory. So by uh, that time frame, early 1880s, um, we had uh, the swamps to the south, where the big open sewer was. Uh, to the west was the old Hyrick Brewery. And I don't know if you've ever stood downwind of a brewery on a hot summer day. Do they still make Carling Black Label up there in Natick? I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, no. <laughs> you know, that, that gets a little aromatic. Um, and to the north of us, about a quarter mile to the north of us was the coal gas works, where they actually burned coal to extract methane from it. They baked the coal to extract methane from it for the city's municipal lighting system. So uh, three sides, we were surrounded by things that's, that, that gave off just god awful stink. And the only direction that the wind could blow that would give you fresh air was from the east. And when the wind blows from the east around here, it blows moisture from the Chesapeake Bay uh, over the Blue Ridge and it forms clouds. So you're, you really, it was just, I mean, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. That was, um, it, it was just terrible. So the new site was built with the knowledge or the, the at least the, uh, the certain hope at the time that the city would never expand to, to find us. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. No, it's pretty busy up that way. The, um, the foggy bottom structures are still there, aren't they? And they seem they to are. be on, on you know, yeah, compared they to- They are, they're still there. Uh, after we moved out, uh, the Navy actually had a, a bright idea to establish the US Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery there. The idea being that if they put the doctors there, they'd figure out a way to do something about malaria. Um, and it was, uh, it was BUMED up until uh, I think about uh, 10 years ago now, when we went through this process called uh, base realignment and closure, uh, and they turned the building over to the State Department. So it now is in the hands of the State Department. And I don't know, uh, I really don't know what they're, what they're doing with the building. It is on the National Register of historic places. So they have to throw some money at it for upkeep. Uh, but how much they do, I don't know. I just, I haven't, uh, haven't had any communication with those folks in a long time. Well, we, we were conversing a while back, quite a while ago, actually, probably a couple of years ago. And I was asking you about the, um, the telescope that Lincoln looked through. And right. you'd mentioned that the only thing that still exists is the lens for that scope. The lens is in the uh, Smithsonian Museum of American History collection. Uh -huh. um, I, I was uh, actually, we, uh, about a, a year or so, ago, or about, yeah, it was about a year or so ago. No, it was, it was just before COVID. We hired a new librarian um, and she had the presence of mind to uh, put in a request for some money to hire an archivist. We haven't had an archivist since I've been there. Um, and they started going through the archives and they started finding all kinds of really, really neat stuff. And one of the things they found was a, uh, uh, some pictures of a telescope that was put together by one of our astronomers named George Peters. Um, George was something of a fixture at the observatory uh, in the latter or the early part of the 20th century. Uh, he was known for constantly walking around the grounds with a big fat cigar, puffing away on it and everything. But he was a photographic tinkerer. Um, so he built a photographic telescope out of spare parts that came up from Foggy Bottom. Uh, so he used the uh, original fork or the original uh, equatorial head from the 26 inch telescope. Um, and the central part of the tube for the 26 inch telescope. And then inside of that, uh, he made a reflecting telescope out of about half the length of the, uh, the tube of the original nine inch telescope. Uh, and it was kind of suspended in this, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the, uh, the declination uh, the, the declination yoke of uh, the old 
tell, I mean, it's, it was complete Frankenscope. Um, but he started doing uh, photographic experiments with that and uh, wound up discovering a couple of asteroids with it. So, um, you know, but again, it was uh, astrophotography in those days, they were still, it was still very much in its infancy. He was looking for a way to, to, to take uh, astrometric plates basically. Um, and uh, ultimately the thing after he, after he retired, the thing fell into disrepair. Uh, the legend has it that uh, the equatorial head for the 26 inch telescope was subsequently removed. Um, the wooden tube, we don't know what happened to that, the wooden part of the nine inch telescope. Uh, and the equatorial head was uh, buried under what are now uh, the tennis courts down in the, what we call the South 40 of the observatory grounds. Uh, so who knows? Um, but uh, it, it really is, uh, there, there's just all kinds of neat stuff up there that uh, literally are being dug up. That's pretty cool. Hey, listen, I'm, I've asked tons of questions. Let me leave it open to others. Anybody else have questions for Jeff? Just unmute yourself and go for it. Because if, if you don't have more questions, I do. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Alan Slisky. I'm actually... Hi, Alan currently president of the Antique Telescope Society. Oh, okay. And have uh, been out to the Flagstaff uh, installations. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed that very much. I haven't been to the DC area stuff, but um, it's nice to see that the history is being kept alive. Uh, we're, we're doing our best. Um, my I was originally hired by uh, the fellow who was uh, Dr. Stephen Dick, who was actually the historian for the observatory. And he was, uh, he was kind of wearing two hats as the historian and the public affairs guy. Uh, so he hired me to be the public affairs guy while he essentially finished writing uh, his uh, little history of the observatory. I got to put a plug in for it here. Uh, it's a little 600 odd page volume on uh, the history of the observatory from 1830 to uh, 2000. Uh, when the book was published in 2003, our scientific director at the time decided we didn't need a historian anymore, so he let Steve go. Um, Steve wound up actually being the uh, head of the NASA history office for the next 10 years, so he did just fine. Um, but um, the, uh, the history since then has been, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's happened since 2000. And uh, I am sorely tempted to, to kind of write a follow on to this, just to uh, kind of catch up to where we are today. Um, now, of course, uh, you, you, you are obviously, uh, you, you know, John Briggs, I guess everybody here probably knows John Briggs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John, when, when it was time to get rid of our 15 inch astrograph, um, the instrument was so detested that uh, they basically, the superintendent said, anybody who wants it can come and get it. Uh, if you can figure out a way to get it off the grounds, it's yours. So one day this guy shows up with a flatbed truck and a crane, and it was John Briggs. So he's got our 15 inch Warner and Swayze astrograph. I yeah. think it's, I don't know where he's got it. It might be out in New Mexico with him. Yeah, he's, sure. yeah he's, uh, he's now collected all that in Magdalena, New Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, it did spend some time under the dome of the uh, Yerkes 36 inch. Oh, uh, okay. 40 inch rather, excuse me. Uh, it, it certainly spent some time under there. Um, under the floor? Under the floor, yep. <laughs> yeah. I went there back in the 80s and I was amazed at how much stuff they had under there. I mean, it was like, you, you could have gone, if, if you were an antique telescope collector, you could have gone completely, just completely nuts under there. It was great. Yeah, some of them were things John was storing there. In fact, John Gray. Yeah. So. Yeah, James, um, James McLaren has had his hand up for a while. Go ahead, James. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, when did the vice presidents get moved in and why? Well, it, it's an interesting story. Um, in 1893, uh, it was determined that, um, well, at that time, our superintendents were, were admirals. 
And so it was determined that a suitable quarters for an admiral needed to be built on the grounds so that he could keep an eye on those astronomers and make sure they were doing what they were getting paid to do. Um, so they hired a local architect uh, and uh, built what is uh, what is now the vice president's residence, but it was built originally as the residence for the observatory superintendent. Um, and as it turns out, as mentioned way back earlier, uh, my great grandfather uh, was a uh, superintendent of the observatory and actually lived in that house for four years. So it's, it's mm. kind of close to me personally in that sense. Um, so it was the superintendent's quarters until one fateful evening uh, in 1928 when the incumbent superintendent, who by then was a captain, uh, invited a number of senior naval officers and their families up for a picnic on a nice July evening. And at that time, the uh, chief of naval operations was quartered down in uh, the Washington Navy Yard. If there is one place in Washington that's probably worse than Foggy Bottom, it is still the Washington Navy Yard. Um, so uh, the CNO comes up and the breezes are blowing and it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's a completely different environment from the smelly swamps that he's been used to. And so as he is uh, riding back down to his quarters at the Navy Yard, he thinks, hmm, I've got four stars. The guy in that house has four stripes. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, so uh, he then gave the superintendent six months to find the new place to live. Um, and uh, 1929, the CNO moved in and it was the uh, CNO's house through the tenure of Admiral Zumwalt. And um, starting in the 60s, uh, um, Spiro Agnew wanted to live in that house. He, he saw it, uh, he was living, I think he was living in an apartment somewhere uh, in town. Uh, as most vice presidents, I mean, all the vice presidents, basically they lived in whatever house they lived in when they got elected. Uh, and uh, the security would then have to figure out a way to secure the house and not tick the neighbors off. Um, but Agnew saw this house and he thought, yeah, this, this, this would be a good place. So uh, he got some friends of his to introduce legislation in 68 uh, to designate it as the residence of the vice president. Well, Admiral Zumwalt had more friends in Congress than Spiro Agnew did. Uh, and so his friends introduced legislation to keep it as the CNO's quarters. And this went back and forth for years. And then finally, after Zumwalt retired, uh, they quickly rushed through legislation to designate it as the residence of the vice president. Uh, the first one who actually had the opportunity to move in was Gerald Ford. But uh, there was this little thing that took place and he found that uh, literally as the moving vans we're at the door of his house out here in Alexandria, where I live. Uh, he found that he was going to be moving to a somewhat tonier address on Pennsylvania Avenue. His vice president was Nelson Rockefeller. Well, Nelson Rockefeller had a house over on Fox Hall Road, which would have, I mean, for the, 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 the house that would have been his on the observatory grounds would have maybe been, uh, you know, a nice little guest cottage on the scale of what he was used to. So he decided he was gonna stay in his place. So the first one to actually move in was Walter Mondale. Uh, and it's been the VP's residence. We've had everybody since then. Uh, I've been there long enough that I've uh, given tours to uh, the Gores, the Cheneys, uh, the Bidens, the Pences, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Harrises. That's nice, that's nice, thank uh, you. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. It's Mark Helton here. Hey, Mark. Um, just curious because the taxpayers pay for all this. Now I realize that this is a naval; these are naval bases and fall under Navy rules and regulations. How much public access is there to any or some of these instruments? Uh, or do you do public outreach as well um, with any of any of at any of these facilities? 
Well, um, I actually did public tours once a week uh, when I started in 1997 and we did those public tours uh, every Monday night except federal holidays until October of 2017. Um, and at that point, uh, basically what happened was they, the, the, uh, the powers that be suddenly woke up to the fact that our master clock system is really the linchpin of uh, how the Department of Defense operates. Without our master clock, there would be no GPS, there would be no encrypted communications, there would be no, uh, the, the, the global network that the DOD relies on to deploy and carry out its mission uh, would, would not exist. Um, suddenly we became a, uh, we, we became a strategic asset. Uh, so since 19, or since 2017, we have been, we have not been able to offer any public tours. And, you know, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't like it. Uh, there's not a whole heck of a lot that I can do about it. Um, I do try to get out uh, with presentations like this, take these on the road to schools, uh, to various other groups, and that sort of thing. Um, oh, excuse me. That of course has been uh, severely limited by COVID in the last year. Uh, we're gradually starting to get back into it. Yours is actually the, uh, let's see, yeah, yours is the second one I've done uh, uh, since we've started to get back on the back on the road again, as it were. Nice. Now the Flagstaff station. Uh, the Flagstaff station is. Um, Flagstaff station is a little different. They uh, they have. Uh, automated gate control out there. So you need a DOD ID to get into the place just in the first place. Uh, you can actually go out and visit the, uh, you can visit the, um, the precision interferometer at Anderson Mesa uh, because that is uh, on property that's owned by Lowell Observatory. Um, I don't think they put a fence around it yet. It's a lot of fence if they do. Thank you very much. Thanks for a great talk. So, Gar, you have, right. you've had your hand up for a long time. Yeah, so, thanks. Uh, hi, this is Sagar. Uh, thanks for the fascinating talk. I uh, work on spacecraft navigation, so I definitely have uh, an appreciation for accurate timekeeping and reference frames. Um, my question is, where do you see the future of um, you know timekeeping standards? Like, what is the next step, and what um, what would drive even more accurate uh, requirements or you know, what applications yeah. would actually benefit or is there um, something that, that's on the horizon? Well, um, the technology that is represented by today's atomic frequency standards is almost as old as I am. Um, the first cesium oscillator was developed by the National Physical Laboratory in Great Britain uh, in the mid 1950s. And most of the atomic frequency standards that we use today are based on that. It's a, what we call a hyperfine transition of uh, the uh, valence electron in, uh, in the cesium atom. Um, and there are, it was, cesium was used for the definition because back in the day when this was, you know, being hammered out, uh, cesium was the, the best behaved of the various uh, elements that they could have used in the laboratory. Uh, the same principle applies to all the alkali metals. So we have hydrogen masers uh, and uh, rubidium fountains. We use rubidium instead of cesium in that type of device because uh, rubidium atom is uh, half the mass of a cesium atom. Uh, if you're gonna trap and cool atoms, uh, if you're gonna trap and cool cesium atoms as opposed to rubidium atoms, you need four times the laser power. 
Uh, and that means things get hot and uh, if you can't run it continuously and we have to run our clocks 24 seven, 365. Um, but uh, the requirements are creeping up on us. Uh, the reason we built the fountain clock in the first place was the requirements for uh, global positioning system three, the new satellite generation that's being launched now um, were uh, 10 times more stringent than the GPS block two. Um, and that was getting pretty close to the best that we could produce with our clock ensemble at the time. Uh, so we needed to figure out a way to make something that was 10 times better. So we'd be in order of magnitude ahead of what the demand was. Well, it's creeping up on us again. So we actually, uh, our, our clock development uh, division which consists of five people, uh, is now working on optical frequency standards. Um, and they are using, um, oh, what the heck is it? They are using a uh, double electron transition in calcium uh, that emits a photon in the blue part of the spectrum. Um, and uh, that photon uh, the frequency of that photon is probably going to be what they use to define, uh, redefine the second at some point, probably in the next 10 years. Um, optical frequency standards are five orders of magnitude higher in frequency than microwave standards. So if we can, if we can build it, uh, we'll be ahead of the game again. But, uh, you know, as they say, uh, if you build it, they will come. Somebody will figure out a way to get a requirement that pushes that limit again. So who knows? Um, but that's the direction that we're going uh, in that sense. Thank you, that's really cool. I like that there's always been sort of a state of the art system there. And I, I couldn't help but notice in one of the slides that you showed Jeff, um, uh, next to the big uh, dome was a time ball. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know that, um, I. I I'm, I'm surprised that ships, I assume on the Potomac could actually see that time ball, um, you know, from-, from Well, down. the time ball, actually the, the first time ball was down at Focky Bottom. Sure. Uh, and it was installed in 1845. And in those days you could see the time ball from, uh, you could see the time ball from Georgetown where most of the commercial maritime traffic came and went. You could see it from the Navy Yard over in the Anacostia River and you could see it as far south as Alexandria, which is, uh, the seaport essentially for the, mm -hmm. for the area. Um, and um, we actually, the, the time ball was uh, dropped every day uh, at noon uh, at the Foggy Bottom site uh, up until 1882. Uh, and they then moved it to the top of what is now the old executive office building uh, next to the White House, mm -hmm. and it uh, operated there until 1936. Um, we also, through uh, telegraphic time distribution, controlled time balls in 19 other ports around the country. That was the way you disseminated time. Um, and uh, there are still a number, the time ball that we have on the main building today is, uh, it, it's kind of a replica. We uh, we put it up there because there were a bunch of old ratty microwave antennas that were rusting out. and We wanted to put something up that looked a little more functional. Some more, more elegant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does work, but it requires a person to pull the handle to drop the ball. Sure, sure. Come a long way, haven't we? <laughs> That's right. We've come a long way. Are there other questions for Jeff? I just noticed the time is getting a little late. Jeff, can I, um, can I officially end the meeting and then we, you know, we yeah. typically leave the meeting open yeah. for a while. Um, yep. Thank you very much. Um, it was a great talk. I know everybody's muted, but like a, a big virtual round of applause. Um, thank you. I'll, thank I'll, you. Um, I'll give you a call. I think I have a number for you. I'll give you a call tomorrow or, uh, you know, whenever, but you're welcome to stick around if you'd like. Let me just grab my screen back. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop your sharing right. so I can go back yeah. to sharing my screen. Yeah. Just hey, because... I know that place. <laughs> okay, <which place? laughs> the one behind you <laughs> oh there you go see i wanted to have, yeah. i wanted a nice appropriate um you know uh background for tonight's meeting so yeah sure you know that place well listen folks um 
So let me officially close out tonight's meeting and thank you all for being here. Um, the next board meeting is going to be on uh, two weeks from tonight on June 24th, uh, 2021 at eight o'clock. I'll send out invitations for that earlier that week. And our next monthly meeting is gonna be the July 8th meeting um, uh, at eight o'clock PM. And I hope to see everybody there again. If you, um, if you um, have something you'd like to present, please get in touch with me and we'll go ahead and do that. And Chris Elledge asked me to remind everybody to please, please, please go on the website, cast your vote for the um, slate of candidates for the board. 